Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bay Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day. It's good to see you. Glad that you're here. Glad you're happy to see each other. I like all this visiting going on. That's wonderful. There's Bob and Susan Russell live from Illinois. Good to see you. Uh, don't worry, I don't call out everybody, so it's okay. Welcome, welcome to all of you, especially those who are visiting with us. We're delighted to have you. Uh, we're glad to have those of you joining us online, trusting that you're there. We never know quite whether you're there or not. So assuming you are, welcome. And uh, it's a delight to be with you. Thank you for your continued prayers. Kathy is still in Virginia helping to get her mom's house ready for renters uh, later on this summer with her mom being in uh, nursing care. She and her brother are hard at work, and so thank you for your prayers for her. And I told somebody I'm getting by. You know, I'm, they got peanut butter at the grocery store, and we're, we're doing okay. Oh, don't worry about Chick-fil-A. Yeah, that's... Man, I've gotten hooked on that tea and lemonade thing they've got. That sun joy, oh, mercy. But let's not get into that. That's, that's a mixed drink. Welcome, all of you. Please bear with me. We will get to serious matters, trust me. Uh, just to mention to you, uh, as you've had announcements uh, running there in front of you on the screens, just to emphasize those items, Ladies, you have your ongoing Bible study on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock, and you're invited. Even if you haven't been coming, know that you can plug into that, and uh, you will be most welcome there as you study First Peter, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Remember, we are not meeting on Thursday evening presently. We'll get back onto that after the 4th of July. Grief care will meet this week as usual. We do have a session meeting on Tuesday at, uh, at 2 o'clock at our usual time. That's for elders and for all of you to please pray for us as we meet. And remember Dr. Poland's ordination service coming up on July the 14th. We're going to lay hands on him <laughs> and looking forward to that as we'll worship together. Uh, Dr. Dave Garner will be here from Westminster Seminary to be preaching and others of us participating in the service. All of us, you as a congregation, are a part of that whole uh, event and so please plan to be here and remember we're planning on that light lunch afterwards uh, as that will be taking place during the morning service so those are just some things to throw out there and mention to you I know that uh, we'll have pastoral prayer in just a little bit but just kind of close circuit to everyone please be in prayer for Rex Sims he will be having a surgical procedure on Wednesday over in Miami I talked to him and Peggy last night and uh I know they're watching this morning, and so I want you to please be in prayer for Rex as he has that uh, uh, procedure on Wednesday on his bladder. And then uh, there are a number of others, but I will leave that. Uh, Pastor John and his family are away on a family trip, so we want to pray for their good health and safety as they uh, undertake that experience. So those are some things to mention. Rachel, Greg, anybody, am I overlooking anything significant? All right. Dave Freskin reminds me when Kathy's away that I'm without adult supervision, so I'm somewhat nervous that I'm leaving out something important that I ought to be saying. But I do, of course, give thanks with you that we have another day to worship the Lord, another Lord's day to gather in his house, to be thankful for his blessings. As I saw the sun come up this morning, thankful that God's mercies are new every morning that his faithfulness is great. So let us worship the Lord our God and prepare our hearts and minds to serve him and worship him and be blessed by him.
Good morning. morning. Call to worship on the inside front cover of our bulletin. It's taken from 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 and 17. Let's read responsibly. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. But I received mercy for this reason. King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. Honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's our hymn as we begin, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. If you're able, stand with me and let's sing together to the glory of God. together. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbled by your majesty and grace as we gather together in your presence. Your word declares in Psalm 100 that we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise, for you are indeed good and your steadfast love endures forever. We exalt your holy name, O Lord, for you alone are worthy of all honor and glory. Forgive us, Father, for the times we stray from your perfect will. Your mercy, as proclaimed by Jeremiah, is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We seek now, Lord, your cleansing and renewal, knowing that in you there is an abundance of grace and forgiveness. As we delight in your presence among us today, may your spirit guide our hearts and minds. Oh, Lord, fill this gathering with your peace that surpasses all understanding. Let your wisdom guide our thoughts and actions that all we do may bring glory to your name. Lord, hear now the prayer of your people as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This is the reading of the word of God, Psalm 7, 1 through 17. O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it to pieces with none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Selah. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, who you, um, you who test the minds and hearts. O righteous God, my shield is with God, who sa saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. We can have our ushers come forward. We'll... Continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Gracious Father, as we come before you <clears throat> with our tithes and offerings, we recognize that all that we have belongs to you and came to us by your hand. You have blessed us abundantly, Lord, and giving back to you is both a commandment and a joyous privilege. Your word reminds us that you love a cheerful giver whose heart is aligned with your generosity. May our giving today reflect our gratitude for your provisions and our love for our neighbor. Let it be used to further your kingdom and to bless those in need as you have instructed us in the Proverbs. May our hearts be united in compassion and our actions bring glory to your holy name and to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are beautiful beyond description. To Is due. I stand in awe of you. 
In awe of him we are because of his holy majesty. And so let us stand together and sing majesty to the glory of God. you'll take out the prayer sheet that's in your bulletin. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the means of grace given to us by our Lord. Prayer, especially corporate prayer for one another and for the kingdom, is a vitally important thing that we do. So take a moment, pick out some names or organizations that you want to pray for and then I will come in and pray. Lord Jesus, we look at this page-long list, and it is but a reflection of all of the needs, not only of this congregation, but of the kingdom. It is a reminder, Lord, that this is in your hands, that we appeal to you through the power and righteousness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to help us. Lord, as we see emulated in Scripture so many times, we come to you with prayer and adoration, asking that you would touch those of our congregation in need. Lord, there are so many medical needs and so many unstated needs, much of which we are powerless, but you are powerful. So Lord, be with them. Calm, anxious hearts, heal broken bodies, and give them, Lord, whatever the outcome, a testimony of your goodness. Lord, we see two institutions that serve the kingdom, and we pray for them, that they would be encouraged, for their labor is never-ending. Lord, would you resource them from your kingdom? Would you encourage them would progress be evident? And Lord, we pray. We pray, Lord, that there might be an awakening in this culture, in this world, that many who are yet far off would come to know you. 
And so, Lord, we ask this humble, cognizant that we are undeserving, but that you are mighty and merciful. And so we appeal to that, Lord. Lord, grow our faith. Let us see your power displayed for all the world to see, even, Lord, in these requests. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Doctor. And now I invite you to give your attention to God's Word, as today we find ourselves in Luke chapter 13, continuing to be thankful for the gospel according to Luke, the good news that that beloved physician has left us, that remains extant even these many centuries after its writing. It is extraordinary that things written so long ago would be a great source of blessing to us even now. Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, we'll read through verse 9. Hear the word of the Lord. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. So we'll ask the Lord to Bless this reading of his word and the preaching of it. May his name evermore be praised. Amen. In times of disaster, it seems everybody's an armchair theologian. People who seldom give a thought about God other than to take his name in vain suddenly are pontificating on television or in writing or wherever you may happen to be about why things happen. We think about all the human-made tragedies. We live in a time when you can be gunned down or stabbed in a public area and it seems as if there is little concern on the part of those who are the perpetrators of such acts and we wonder why do these things happen we face the reality every day that life is brief we are of course conditioned to think in terms of the longevity of life after all we've had wonderful lectures here on how we can live to be a hundred if we'll eat the right things and do the right things and Every day I'm reminded about what I ought to be doing instead of what I am doing. Just know that when I get to heaven, I'll be saving a place for all of you who are health conscious. And we're generally inclined to think that we'll live a long time, and we have people among us who have lived a long time. But there are always those things that can, as we say it, cut life short that uh, we can go before our time. The Lord Jesus here talks about two tragedies, and this is the only place we have them recorded in history. There are uh, no other places that we're told about these events which happen. One, of course, uh, doesn't require a lot of description. We know that Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor at the time, and who, of course, will be an instrument in the trial of the Lord Jesus and his crucifixion, was a man who was ruthless. We know that from other sources as well as from Scripture. And so it is perfectly within his character that he, for whatever reason, decided that a group of Galileans who had come to Jerusalem, presumably at the time of the Passover, for that's the only time that a sacrifice would be offered by someone or someones other than the priests, as they were offering these sacrifices, they were murdered. 
They were killed, and the blood, their blood, was mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. It is a horribly violent thing to consider. Why it happened, we don't know. What offense had they committed, we are not told. But they nevertheless are, for all practical purposes, murdered. And their sacrifices that they had brought before the Lord have their own blood mingled with them. It is repulsive to think about it. But at an occasion like this, there are theological um, pronouncements made. Surely these people must have sinned greatly. They must have done something that was worse than other people, and therefore that's why they were killed, people trying to posit some theological reason. And the Lord Jesus says something extraordinary. He doesn't deny the fact that there was some purpose or reason for it, but it's not for us to think of them as being worse sinners It is for us to take away from this the lesson that life can be, in our manner of thinking, cut short. And there's the need for all of us to repent. You see, it's a lot easier for us to talk about the sins of others rather than grapple with our own transgressions. It's easy to talk about how those wicked people should have had something happen to them without considering our own shortcomings. I probably told you, but I remember back, I think it was in 2005, when Hurricane Katrina struck the Gulf Coast north of here and hit Mississippi and Louisiana awfully hard. Louisiana, of course, took a hard hit, especially in New Orleans. And I remember walking in the local gas station a day or two after that happened in the town where I was ministering, and all the gentlemen were in there drinking coffee, and they were pontificating about the day's events. And one of them said, well... That hurricane hit there in New Orleans because all those people sinned so badly down there. It's just a terrible place and all that wickedness, and it's no wonder God took it out. And I said, do you think there was worse wickedness in New Orleans, that there were worse things going on in that city that are happening in the homes right here in this little county that we're living, that people are not piping into their homes the same kind of iniquity that you're complaining about that supposedly happened in New Orleans. I said, if God operated on that basis, we would all be wiped out in the next split second. I still believe that. When something like that happens, it is for us to remind, to be reminded that life is extraordinarily brief. We're not guaranteed tomorrow, and we better repent. You see, everyone has a theology. Even atheists have a a knowledge of God or a a thought process toward the things of God, and that's what theology is. And so for these people to make the pronouncement that they did is a commentary on all of us. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Too many times in our own Christian life, we're prone to blame the world's problems on those people, the wickedness and the evil of those people. And I recall to mind how that God speaks to his people in the Old Testament in Second Chronicles. And he says, if my people, who are called by my name, Ron, will humble themselves and pray. If my people, who are called by my name. He doesn't say, if those wicked people out there who deny me and take my name in vain, if they would only repent and humble themselves and turn to me, then I will relent and heal their land. But no, he He calls on his own people to repent. And it is for us, gathered here in worship today, not to decry the evilness, wickedness that's taking place in the world around us, but to consider our own condition. It is for us not to think that they are worse offenders, but to consider the sin in my own life and to realize repentance has to start right here with me. But everyone has a theology. It's just there's good theology and there's bad theology. But everybody has theology. That we need to understand. We also need to understand this warning that God gives to everyone, everywhere, to repent. Now, I know, and I've said it recently, but it's in our text again, and so we have to consider it, that repentance is not a popular subject. We want to be able to come to God and experience all the benefits that he grants. We want to be able to be blessed by God and enjoy prosperity and everlasting life, but not have to change. But salvation by its very nature means a change of nature. 
The Lord Jesus says, unless we are born again, we will not see the kingdom of heaven. And all that is entailed in regeneration, all of it implies a transformation, a change of nature. We come to him just as we are, but he doesn't leave us that way. He changes us. And our culture is, as every culture does, civilization down through the ages, wants the benefits of a relationship with God without the responsibility of repenting. But God requires it of us. Repent and believe the gospel. As John the Baptist had commanded from the Lord, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Because repentance is a, is a change of mind. It is a change of mind. We come to realize those things that God hates and despises. And we should be praying every day that, that our attitude toward sin would increasingly be the same attitude that God has toward it. Rather than ignoring it or seeking to redefine it or talk about it in terms other than the way that God describes it, to look at it for what it is. To have a change of mind concerning those things that grieve the heart of God and turn away from those things. Again, I've said it many times, but I'll repeat it. The world thinks that sin is breaking religious rules, but remember, sin is anything that displeases God. Anything that grieves the heart of God, anything that is contrary to his will, as he has revealed it in his word. And his word hasn't changed because God hasn't changed. And refusing to repent brings catastrophic results. Having blood mingled with sacrifices is terrible. Having a, a tower fall on you near the, presumably near that area that we speak of as the pool of Siloam, probably a tower that was a part of the wall construction around Jerusalem for whatever reason, it fell and killed people. Those are terrible circumstances. But that's not the worst of it. The worst part of death is not dying as we see and experience it, but it is that second death which comes for those who have rejected God's word, refused to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus. When I was at General Assembly a week before last in Richmond, I saw Dan Iverson. Dan Iverson has served for many years in Japan and has uh, retired. His uh, grandfather, Dr. Dan Iverson, was for many years a pastor over in Miami at the Shenandoah Presbyterian Church. He wrote the hymn that we still sing, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Afresh on Me. And so I was speaking to grandson Dan Iverson, and we were having a conversation, and, and uh, I said, you know, you're one of my heroes. You're one of those missionaries who who left. He served a stint in the Marine Corps, and then he went to Japan and uh, has been responsible for the planting of churches, and it's wonderful to see how generationally the gospel continues to work as uh, it is in his own children. His father, Dr. Bill Iverson, was a man who would share the gospel with anybody, anywhere. In fact, it was Bill Iverson who taught a man by the name of Kennedy Smart how to share the gospel, and Kennedy Smart taught a man by the name of D. James Kennedy how to share the gospel, and D. James Kennedy put it in a book and developed a ministry and program out of it called Evangelism Explosion, but Bill Iverson is the grandfather of Evangelism Explosion, and I remember sitting at lunch with him at Western Carolina University in 1985, I had just graduated from high school. We were having a Presbyterian Evangelistic Fellowship Conference there. Get all that out. Say that 15 times real fast. And we were sitting at the table. The waitress came by to take our order. Bill Iverson, wonderful man who shared the gospel through the years, talking to the waitress. He got her name and was having a good conversation with her. And he said, he said, I want to ask you a question, and I want you to think about the answer. I don't want you to answer it right now, but here's something of a riddle for you, and you just think about this, and as you come back, we'll talk about it. And she said, oh, okay. He said, if you're born once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, you'll only die once. What does that mean? Boy, she got a puzzled look on her face, and he said, do you think about that? And as she would come back and check on us, they would continue the conversation. And before it was over, Bill had explained it, you know, that those who die without Christ, without having experienced the second birth, will experience that second death. And it's a horrible thing to consider. But if you're born again, if you experience not only having been born by way of being brought forth from your mother, but being born by the Spirit of God from above, you don't ever have to be concerned about that second death. 
and so help me, by the time she brought back the check, she was praying with him to receive Christ and to trust in him. And so here I was all these years later getting to tell that story to his son Dan who said, I get it, he did that everywhere. But God's warning is clear. We are called on to repent and to refuse that warning, which is clearly communicated brings catastrophic results, worse than having blood mingled with sacrifices or a tower falling on us, a building of some sort. But that second death, which is depicted so clearly for us in Scripture, remember, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus says more about hell during his earthly ministry than he says about heaven. You ever thought about that? Why is that? Because he came as an embodiment of the love of God. And because God loves us, he warns us. And no one will ever be able to stand before God on the judgment day and claim that he or she has not been warned. God has done it. But he goes on and he speaks in a manner of a parable. And he uses the imagery of a fig tree, a fig tree planted in the midst of a vineyard. You know, uh, this isn't a changing of the subject, by the way. Uh, my mama, years ago, she picked up a phrase from somebody, and I don't know where it was, but Daddy and I would always smile when she would use it. In the middle of a conversation, sometimes she would say, well, changing the subject drastically. He doesn't really change the subject here. He just simply goes on to explain what we need to be thinking about when we think in terms of the brevity of life. And so using this imagery of a fig tree in the middle of a place where grapes are grown, in the middle of a vineyard, and of course it's very clear, here's this fig tree and it's not yielding any fruit. Now somebody might come along and say, but it's a nice looking tree. You know, Bob Ross, the painter, could say it's a happy little tree. Can't you see him painting it? It's a happy little tree. You can put that tree wherever you want it, but it's a happy little tree. But the problem with the tree is it's not bearing fruit. It's not yielding anything. It's not producing what it's supposed to produce. The nature of the thing is such that fruit is what's supposed to come from it. Now, we need to recognize, of course, that God uses the fig tree as a symbol of his people in the Old Testament. Uh, we see that in... Hosea 9, Joel 1, we also see it in Jeremiah and uh, in other places. And so here we recognize immediately that Jesus is not giving a lesson on horticulture. I hope I'm using the right phrase. He's not giving us a lesson on, uh, on trees and grapevines. He's, he's talking about his people, those who are called his people, those who are great beneficiaries of his blessing, those who are in a privileged position because of God's favor granted. And that fig tree symbolizes that. And God's people in the Old Testament had failed to yield the fruit of repentance. They continued to claim a relationship with him, but not live the life of faith, and so great judgment had come upon them. God expects fruit of those who are in this privileged relationship, who claim to know him. Jesus speaks about fruitfulness. Of course, John 15 is the most famous place where he talks about the, uh, how that he is the vine and you are the branches and how that as branches we are to abide in him and therefore as we abide in him we bear much fruit. But those branches that don't bear fruit are pruned, are cut away, are taken away, are cleansed, are removed. Fruitfulness is not an option in the Christian life. Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. See if I can get all these. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All right, that's nine. I got them. I didn't like the way I count. If there had been two more, I'd been in trouble. <laughs> fruit of the Spirit. You see, when Jesus comes into our lives and we are born again as the Spirit indwells us and enables us to believe this glorious truth of the gospel, 
It's a transformation that takes place. We are united to Christ. And we cannot be united to Christ and do anything other than bear fruit. If we claim a relationship with Christ and yet our life doesn't look increasingly like the Lord Jesus, then you have to consider, in whom am I abiding? Harry Reader used to say, if there's no fruit, look at the root. If there is no fruit, you have to think in terms of just what or whom am I abiding in because if we have been transformed by the Spirit of God, have a saving relationship with Christ, we are therefore in Christ, and there will be evidence of that new life born out, and the Bible speaks of that as fruit. And because that tree is not bearing fruit, the owner of the vineyard is going to remove it and take it away. Ultimately, that's what happens. But in our passage, as we have it here, we have a demonstration, I believe, of the intercession of Christ. For we have the one who oversees matters for the owner in the vineyard speaking up and saying, hold on, give me another year. Let me work with this tree. Put a little fertilizer around it more politically correct, isn't it? I'm not going to say what Harry Truman called it. Put a little fertilizer around the tree. Let me work with it. And in another year, you may find it's bearing fruit. But if not, then you can take it away. I believe the Lord Jesus places this part of the story here to remind us that we have one who intercedes, that we have one who continues to work in us and for us on our behalf. And we can be thankful for that. At any given time, of course, God would have more than enough reason to take any of us out of the vineyard. But it's because of our relationship with Christ that we endure and that we have hope for the future. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, who is to condemn? Remember how that chapter begins? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, I can't tell you. How many times that verse comes to mind, and I am so thankful. I remember driving one day, and I was, I was thinking about my own tendency. I was having trouble of being angry toward other drivers. Now, I know you don't have that issue, but I just want to tell you that I haven't come to the place in my sanctification yet where I can drive peacefully and placidly down the road and not have bad thoughts toward people who pull out in front of me and do things. So here I was, I was angry at the person in front of me, and I thought, why am I angry at this person? I don't even know who that person is. They might be in a hurry to go somewhere. Maybe, maybe they've got an emergency, and they need to go to the doctor. I mean, all kinds of things are coming to mind. I said, Lord, please forgive me. What right do I have to be angry? And then I started thinking about all the times I've probably done stupid things and caused somebody else to be angry at me. And here I was with all of this in my heart, and I remember this verse coming to mind. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus as I confess my sin to the Lord. You know, I started crying. I almost had to pull over. And I thought, boy, somebody behind me is going to think I've had too much to drink because I was probably <laughs> weeping as I was trying to wipe my eyes, and I was thinking about the goodness of God and how he is so willing to forgive us and how I justly deserve that condemnation. But because I'm in Christ, I don't have to fear it. I know, I know that my sins are forgiven. I don't ever want to presume on that. But yet I'm so thankful. So carrying that thought forward down in verse 34 of chapter 8, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? The one who suffered in my stead. The one who died for me. The one who was raised for my justification. The one who is ascended and is now in the presence of God, seated at his right hand. He's the one who intercedes for me. Wow. You ever had somebody to speak up for you when you were in trouble? I've said before and uh, mentioned it again, my mother's first cousin back home was the sheriff for some 25 years. And I don't know how Jack Arrington knew. And if anybody from Haywood County is watching this, you can bear testimony. That man seemed to know where everybody was at any given time. I remember mentioning at a family reunion one time when we were talking about an event that had occurred on a Thursday. I don't remember what it was. And I said, oh, I said, well, I was, I was down on Fines Creek then. And Jack said, yeah, I heard about that. 
We couldn't get away with anything in my hometown. My parents didn't have to worry when we were out. There were people watching us. And um, I remember on, uh, on one occasion, somebody at school, I was a senior and I'd gotten too big for my britches and I was president of the student body and I was a squadron commander of the junior ROTC unit there and you know thinking you're somebody when you're 17 years old is a dangerous thing and uh, yet somebody accused me of uh, being at a party that had been taking place they, they said I was staggering drunk at this party this this kid who's in these position leads Bible studies during homeroom and I didn't have any way to defend myself my cousin Jack Arrington happened to be on campus that morning and the principal was talking. The principal didn't believe I was there, but people were, you know, this rumor was going around. And Jack said, I broke up that party. He said, I know everybody that was at it. He said, and I happen to know Patrick was spending the night at my Aunt Allie's house. That squelched it. You see, for me to have defended myself would have been useless. But when the sheriff spoke up for me, I was off the hook. We have somebody bigger than the high sheriff speaking up for us. Yes, we've sinned. We're guilty of the things most likely that we're <coughs> accused of. But he's paid the penalty. He's done the time. He's died the death. He has been to the depths of hell for us and has come back and he is before the Father and he is the one who says, she's with me. He's with me. And that's our hope, ladies and gentlemen. We have transgressed and we have sinned. The whole world has done it. God commands repentance. We have no excuse for failing to do it. God expects fruit from those who are in Christ. We have no excuse for failing to produce but the one who is in us is fully capable of producing that which God requires. And that's grace. And so I say to you again, the good news is far better than you possibly can imagine. We have a wonderful Savior who's revealed true truth to us. The solution will not come from any other quarter, but it comes from God himself and the person of his Son. And by his authority, we are free because we're united to his life. He intercedes for us. Somebody used to say back home, it's, uh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Somebody else used to say, I think this was an uncle. At least I've got an image of him, but I heard it in childhood. If you can't be somebody, know somebody. Who is anybody before the presence of an all-holy and righteous God? Who among us could ever plead a case successfully and say, well, I know I've fallen short, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. What excuse do you think you have to offer that would be acceptable to the judge on that day? And I say to you, none of us has anything we can plead except the blood of Christ. I deserve the death and I deserve the condemnation. But by the power and person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that condemnation is taken away and he keeps working with me. And the fruit, it's not what it ought to be. But you know, there's evidence that one greater than me is at work. And I pray you know the same. And if you don't, what a wonderful day. What a wonderful day to say, you know, I get this. I don't get it to the full satisfaction of my curiosity, but, you know, I get enough that I know I need Jesus. As a lady came up to me at the end of the service one day with tears just streaming down her face, and she said, Preacher, I need Jesus, and I can't live one more day without him. And if that's in your heart today, thanks be to God, you can cling to him he will receive you. I was watching a video this past week. One of my heroes from the Statler brothers, Jimmy Fortune, was talking about how that 
He still cannot to this day sing the second stanza of the beloved hymn because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby. Do you remember it? Because Jimmy, when he was very young, was there in the hospital when his firstborn, Jimmy Jr., was born with serious birth defects. And he remembers yet walking into the room where the child was and seeing these defects and just being devastated and heartbroken. And doctors were able to perform surgeries, and, and uh, that young man is alive today. But Jimmy said something happened to him then that when he sings that song, he does the other two verses, but not that one. And yet he realizes that God is faithful because in that moment he remembered something that his mother had told him. She said, Jimmy, son, no matter how bad it gets, don't ever run away from God. Run to him. And I say to you today, no matter how bad you think you are or how difficult the circumstances are in life, don't run away from God. Run to him. Run to the Lord Jesus. And he will receive you because he promised and he has never once gone back on his word. Repent and believe the gospel. And know that having been born twice, if Jesus tarries, you'll only die once. And what is that? Death. But a means of ushering you into the presence of the one who has redeemed you. That's what I've got. But I can't think of any better news than that to leave you with. And so may God bless you to know him today. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. You are wondrous and kind and good beyond our comprehension. And we ask you, O Lord, to work in our hearts that we may know you, the one true God, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, who has died for our sakes. He is our teacher. And so, Father, please, please bless that inasmuch as what your Son has said has been accurately conveyed here may we never get away from it if there is anything that has been said contrary to your word or will just cause it quickly to depart from our minds that our eyes will so be open that we would see jesus and our ears would be so open that we may hear him and him only for this we pray in his name amen so you get the sense, turn around and go home. That's what repentance is. And as we conclude our service, let's sing, Oh, for a heart to praise my God. Stand with me. Let's sing together. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up unto you his countenance and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. And everyone said together. <laughs>